Hey, Renter Retires, it's Adam Schrader here once again with Zach Lamaster for another episode. And we are joined by two CPAs, Matt McFarland and Amanda Hahn. They are co founders of Keystone CPA. And no, we're not going to talk about how to prepare your taxes. We're going to have another episode about tax strategy because, as we've discussed before, strategizing how not to pay taxes is about as important as not paying your taxes. Well, not paying taxes legally, of course. So uh, Matt and Amanda, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having us, guys. appreciate it. Absolutely. So why don't we start just a little bit of why did y'all go the route of tax strategy as opposed to just, you know, general when people think CPA is just tax prep? What what led y'all to be interested more in the, the strategy side of things? Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. I've never been asked that before. Um, <laughs> well, our background is um, that we came from a big four public accounting and we happen to be in the real estate specialty group. So uh, in working with uh, at our old job was working with a lot of larger uh, investment firms, developers. And um, for people at that level, they really focus a lot on the planning side of things. Um, and for us, we just felt that, you know, for the average investor, Matt and I are investors ourselves. Right. There's not a lot of. Um, uh, education out there about how smaller investors should do tax planning also. Uh, we might not be saving billions of dollars or millions of dollars, but if we could save, you know, even five, 10, 20, 30 thousand dollars, it's a pretty significant dollar amount um, in terms of what we can use to invest. So, um, you know, that's that's kind of how we kind of got us started on, you know, let's make sure we bring a lot of those strategies that are traditionally for those very high income, large investors down to the everyday investors like ourselves. Yeah, excellent. That's fantastic. I love that. And and maybe it starts with, you know, five, ten, thirty thousand dollars, but ultimately, you know, potentially millions of dollars, right? If if as people really grow their portfolio. Um, you guys are investors yourself, so that's fantastic. We always stress the importance of working with tax strategists and CPAs that are investors themselves and really understand the full capacity of, of what real estate, you know, offers. I mean, do you would you agree that real estate is probably one of the best asset classes and investments as far from a tax perspective is i mean i think that's kind of a unanimous answer but i'm i'm, I'm curious to hear about um i mean were you were you real estate investors first or did you go into the the uh, accounting world after that or vice versa and maybe we can get, just do like a quick overview of some of the key highlights just for the everyday investors some of the big tax benefits of owning real estate that'd be great yeah i mean i think for, for, for i mean amanda can talk on her she you know she had some history of uh, investors in her family, my family, not so much. So my kind of exposure to it was working at the big four where I kind of, I think my, my aha moment was working on this, you know, I don't know, 60 year old retired guy's tax return. It was, he was making six figures in cash flow, but not paying any taxes because of depreciation. And it was like, that's when the, you know, the light bulb went off. Right. And living was, the dream. Uh, yeah. Kind of seeing that I was like, Oh wow. Okay. This is, this is why people do this, you know? And so, yeah, I mean, obviously, it's kind of, you know, as you joked, right, it's a loaded question about it. Is this one of the best asset classes from a tax perspective? For sure, obviously, you know, it's, um, you know, it's like when you go out and buy, you know, Google stock, right, you're not writing off the purchase price of Google stock when you when you buy it, you actually don't get to write it off until you sell it down the road, right? But with, you know, rental properties, as we all know, we can, the IRS allows you to take that paper write off for depreciation. So that's one of those beautiful things that we love about from a tax planning perspective, you know, why we love real estate. Yeah. yeah. And I think for, you know, regardless of what type of investor you are, whether you're just someone small, uh, starting out small, if you have a full time job and you just have one rental or you're even just house hacking or a couple of rental properties. Um, one of the biggest benefits, like Matt mentioned, is this whole concept of depreciation, where we can write off part of, or we could depreciate part of the purchase price of a building over the life of the property. And that's where you see a lot of people where, um, you know, you, you're getting cash flow, right, on the properties, but at the same time, you're not paying, having to pay taxes currently on the cash flow. And also as a real estate investor, you know, what when you hear people talk about, oh, you know, the tax loopholes uh, or the tax code is written to benefit the business owners. Um, what it's really important for us to understand as real estate investors is that we are also business owners. 
in the eyes of the IRS. So, so real estate investing is a business in itself. So a lot of the things that you hear people talk about in terms of, you know, write-offs, writing off part of your, your car or your cell phone or your home office, a lot of those are available to real estate investors um, because we're in the business, right, of investing in real estate. And, and by business, they're not really talking about a corporation or an LLC, which is probably one of the most uh, frequently missed or you know biggest misconceptions people have um, is people always tell us like, hey, I, I heard you on a podcast and you talk about writing off your car or paying your kids and writing it off, but I don't have an LLC yet. Do I need to go ahead and form an LLC? And for the most part, it's not really uh, necessary or it's not required. Let's say that um, it's not required to have it because if you are a landlord, as an example, you are already in the business of real estate investing, regardless of whether you have an LLC or not. Right. So a lot of these strategies are available to you just simply because you're an investor. I love that. And Matt, to your point on um, that, that aha moment. So many times we've we've talked to uh, accountants and people that are preparing, you know, returns for people, and just seeing you you get to see behind the scenes financially what they're doing, right? And so when you get to have that insider look at someone that's really successful, in the majority of the times they they have rental real estate, or if you're seeing someone that is able to reduce their taxable liability significantly, which gives you a lot more money to reinvest at that point in time, which is right. how people really scale over time. Um, but it gives you that kind of behind the scenes look at like, this is how people are creating generational wealth and, and being ultra successful. And so you kind of get a leg up on maybe looking at those type of, you know, businesses and investment opportunities. So it keeps coming back to real estate. We've, we've heard that so many <laughs> times, but as, as far as rental real estate, when we kind of look at, okay. And, and Amanda, that was an excellent point about the LLC structure. Cause that's, that's the most common question is like, okay, do I need an LLC set up? And really what, what can you write off and how should you be tracking this stuff? Can we just go through and do a quick bullet point of, of some things that are acceptable write-offs? I mean, we have your your tax insurance. You know, what about your your accounting and your you know legal fees, your cell phone? Your, I mean, how do you how do you track that? And what really can we write off as the everyday investor? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, uh, the key thing to keep in mind is that the IRS allows you to write off a business deduction uh, to the extent that it, what they consider it's ordinary and necessary to your business. So then the question becomes, as a real estate investor, what are some of the expenses that are ordinary, right? Typically, an investor might have. And is it necessary, necessary for me to have that expense to invest in my real estate, to grow my real estate or take my real estate to the next level? Um, so a lot of the things you mentioned, um, definitely, right? Um, accounting fees, if you have a bookkeeper, a tax strategist, legal fees, right? Hiring an attorney to help you with entity formation or entity maintenance, um, obviously all the marketing that you're doing, uh, but also a lot of educational stuff too, right? Paying for, for memberships or going to a local real estate meetup, going to, I might say there's a lot of real estate conferences going on right now. So tickets to those conferences, the flights there, the hotels there, the, the meals when you're at the conferences, all those are legitimate business deductions because the reason that you have those expenses is to uh, help your real estate right with your current and or future real estate investments so it's really important to make sure you are tracking those expenses um, what i always tell people is that you know as an investor you are the first line of defense um, in terms when it comes to tax deductions and what i mean by that is you have to be the one to track those expenses Let's say, for example, you went to a real estate conference this month and you didn't remember to record it. You didn't have copies of the receipts or any kind of documentation to prove the money was spent and what it was for. If you don't have that, odds are you're not going to take a deduction for it. Why? Because your CPA probably didn't know you went to the conference. They probably didn't know you spent that money. So, so make sure you are taking the time to track those expenses and then providing it to your tax person uh, tax time next year, right? The worst that could happen is they can say, oh, actually, this particular expense is not deductible because of X, Y, Z reason. But first and foremost, you have to be the one to track it and present it to them because otherwise, odds are they don't know that that was actually an expense you incurred. Can Adam write off his bar tab when he's buying drinks for everyone at one of these conferences <laughs> and, uh, you know, net networking? Um, no, I think with the, really the question is on, on the tracking because that's something we have often have confusion about is, how, how do I, and hopefully your, your account um, is giving you some, or your tax strategist is giving you some guidance on this, but is this, um, and, and people look at IRS from a, a standpoint of fear, and I think it's a lot of times misunderstanding, 
of, oh, am I doing something wrong here? And I, I think you brought up a, a really good point about, you know, the worst, I guess, in an audit scenario, potentially that something's not allowed, you know, you may have to, you know, that may not be allowed and you pay taxes on it, potentially a penalty, I guess, maybe at some degree, but you really should be tracking this to the best of your ability. So how do you, how do you track that? Is it, do they need physical copies of receipts? Do you need to have minutes at these, th these meetings? Do you need to have just, Hey, I went to this conference. Here's like, here's the dates to justify that I went. I mean, how do you prove that? You know what I mean? Yeah. I, mean, I think a couple of things come to mind. I mean, you know, from a, from a peer tracking standpoint, yeah. Keeping copies of the receipts is, is, uh, is uh, important and you need to do that. Now it doesn't need to be, luckily it doesn't have to be the hard copy of the receipt anymore. The IRS does allow you to scan it and um, you know, you can put um, notes on it and then scan it and keep that, just keep that in your digital file, what have you. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, you want to keep notes on, you know, if it's a meal, right. You went out to, you went out to dinner to talk to a potential investor about a, you know, ABC deal. Right. So you're keeping notes on the receipt as to what was discussed during the meeting uh, the receipt will have, you know, the, obviously the date and all that kind of good stuff. But so keeping track of those receipts and then also just having a way to uh, keep track of the actual expenses from like a bookkeeping standpoint. Right. So it's either, you know, a lot of our clients use QuickBooks, but that's not the only that's not the one and only thing out there from a bookkeeping standpoint. Yeah. Uh, some of our clients use Excel, you know, so it's kind of whatever works, works for them. Yeah, I think people are always asking, like, how should I track my expenses? And the answer to that really is could be different from investor to investor. So even um, between the two of you it might be different, right? So uh, as long as it's a methodology that works for you, as the investor, that's going to be key. So if you're someone who's pretty good with software, um, QuickBooks is great, right? It has a lot of automations. You can download a lot of information from your bank and credit card statements. So that's awesome. But if you're someone who does not like software, you don't like to learn it, then QuickBooks is probably not something for you. If you're more like Excel, right? I can, I can type everything in, then that's great. Um, and the reason it's important that it's something that works for you is, again, you are the first line of defense. So it has to be a system that you can use comfortably so that you'll be doing it consistently and be able to track those right well, we see that uh, miss is like if you don't track things for about three to six months odds are you've forgotten what you spent money on <laughs> and i i'm so terrible at keeping receipts that's just something i really am, don't do a lot of times but i will download i mean i have my i have my bookkeeper i have my accountant my cpa and then i have my tax <laughs> strategist and those are all three different organizations I, they communicate thankfully uh but a lot of times it's like okay let's Let's do some reconciliation to go back and look at all the expenses on the business credit card. And then I got to go through and write through. I don't have a good system doing that, but you know, I'm also <laughs> well, not the one keeping receipts and writing on them and stuffing them in the wallet and things like that. So, yeah. And I think, you know, the, I mean, you, you really don't have to spend a ton of time on the receipts. You know, what, what, what we do is we just take a picture of those receipts and um, okay. you know, over time you just kind of follow it away in a folder, right? The odds of that receipt being requested are very low, right? You only have to produce a receipt if, you're audited and if the auditor is questioning that specific transaction but hopefully you do have documentation like in addition to the receipt um, if you use google calendar as an example right you can always pull the receipt and say okay on this date i had lunch with matt and we talked about whatever right or you can go to your email and say okay here are all the things that matt and i talked about or we were scheduled to talk, to talk about for that particular meal um, so you know i think in this digital age a lot of this stuff is already documented naturally because of how we live our lives and you know everything is email text phone call um, so you know a lot of those things are probably readily available if you ever needed to pull them up yeah, you just don't want to start that process on April 14th, Zach. <laughs> I, I've been there, Adam. And then you get in, yeah, extensions and it's it's chaos. And you got to go through a whole month of trying to yeah. figure out what you did over the last year. Yeah, I love when you all talked about depreciating stocks. I, I just got to thinking, uh, just jumping back a little bit. It's like when you depreciate your Google stock, you've literally lost money. Uh, at least that's when you sell. So uh, what I say there. Now you have, um, when I went to your website to look over kind of who you all are and what you did, it popped up that y'all have uh, an ebook on one of the things that it, that y'all cover in that ebook is the most common and costly tax mistake by investors. So what is the most common and costly um, tax mistake by investors? Well, <laughs> there's actually so many, um, so many of them, but I know in the ebook, we talked about um, people who are real estate professionals and they don't claim that legitimately. Um, so, so real estate professional, um, so in the tax world, there are sometimes limitations 
in terms of how much rental losses can offset your non-rental income. So for example, W-2 income uh, or income from a business that you that you own. So if you're someone whose income is over $150,000, then your rental losses can only offset rental or other passive income. Um, so one of, but one of the ways around that is if you or your spouse can meet real estate professional status. So if you own long-term rental properties and you or your spouse is a real estate professional, then and you no longer have that limitation. So rental losses can offset other income like W-2 and maybe other businesses that you might have. Um, so this is, you know, a, a common big mistake. That's one that we mentioned in our ebook. But I think a, another really common mistake that we see uh, from investors is really not understanding the difference that there is actually a difference between tax return filing and tax planning. So earlier you were saying, okay, I so for you know I have a bookkeeper, I have a tax preparer, and then I have a tax strategist. Um, you're the first person I've heard in a long time who actually says that because a lot of people just assume that whoever's preparing my return is also doing my planning for me. Um, and I think a lot of our listeners probably know that that's a false assumption, right? Because when you're meeting with your tax person in March or April, April 14th, apparently, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're probably up to their eyeballs and tax filings, right? A lot of them are probably not saying, hey, let's brainstorm and strategize on what's going on for the rest of this year. Um, and that's really what you should be doing. Now, albeit April 15th is not the best time to do it, but you know, in the summertime, right, today, for example, this is a good time to reach out to your tax person. And if there's someone who offers tax planning, um, it's a really great idea to talk to them about what are my plans this year for real estate? Am I looking to refinance properties? Am I looking to maybe sell some properties and expecting a gain, right? Or maybe I just have, you know, a lot of um, stocks where Google stocks have gone up or crypto has gone up. What are some of the things I can do to reduce taxes? Um, because it's only through tax planning where you have the options and different things that you can utilize to offset taxes. If the first time you're asking, how do I save taxes is in April when you're sitting with your CPA to prepare the return, um, that's probably too late right because everything has already happened in the previous year so i like um, to look at it a like a offensive and defensive type of play because your your defense is your account that's filing the taxes and they're looking at your scenario at that point in time but then the offensive strategy of course is leading up to that point in time everything that you need to be doing which you really need to have those conversations now for this year because at the end of the year there's certain things that you have to have done you have to own property this year to take tax benefits on it this year. So there's, there's certain things you have to do right now. So that's so such an essential piece. And I always hit the point home with people that having the right tax team in place is worth their weight in gold plus more. Like they end up saving, the right team saves you way more than they cost you. And this is something that we get a common question about of even people and the newer investors. And that's okay, them filing their own taxes uh, you know, initially, but we really don't encourage that. Depreciation is a perfect example. You're required to take depreciation. If you don't, you get, you know, it, it's factored <coughs> in your, your taxes just as if you did. You got to pay it pay back anyway. So, I mean, those are certain things you just need to be aware of. Kind of switching gears here to the average investor who's just holding rental real estate. What are some what are some things that are just normal write-offs or deductions that the average investor always gets? Things like mortgage interest, normal depreciation. What else? Yeah, I mean, I think from from a from a rental property perspective, a lot of people you know, most, most investors don't, <clears throat> don't forget about, you know, the mortgage interest or the property taxes, the insurance, uh, utilities, obviously is a common expense. Um, you know, some have homeowners association dues. Um, but a lot of times, some of those overlooked ones that we were kind of talking earlier, you know, you were asked about cell phone, uh, auto expenses, right? So people, a lot of investors are driving around looking at properties or looking at their existing properties they're trying to find new properties. They're going to meetings, you know, all those business miles add up. And so you want to make sure that you are taking advantage of the, you know, auto expense deduction uh, for, for your situation. Um, yeah. Also, um, income shifting to kids or other family members who might be in a lower tax bracket than you. So we have clients who have um, kids who can help them out. You know, they're old enough where they can help out in their rental properties. And so instead of just giving them an allowance for, you know, doing nothing right over the summer break, <laughs> why not have them help you out in your real estate? They can help with turnover. They can help you with um, all kinds of, you know, maybe administrative tasks or even marketing things that they can do. And basically it allows you to take a tax deduction 
for the work that they're providing for you. And if your kids are someone, you know, hopefully or ideally they're in a low or zero tax bracket, that can result in some pretty significant tax savings. Um, we also, you know, a lot of times I think we, when we talk about the power of tax planning, right, something you mentioned before, like, well, the money we save in taxes is money we can reinvest in real estate. So if you're someone who saved $20,000 in taxes in either one or a couple years, that could be a down payment on $100,000 right. worth of real estate, right? Versus, you know, the $20,000 that we pay to the IRS, we know what the return on investment is, right? <laughs> it's I love zero. That compounding. Yeah, you love that <laughs> compounding effect because not only are you not giving it to Uncle Sam right now, but then you get to go out and re invest it, earn a return on investment on that money, and then buy yourself into additional tax benefits. And so there's this snowball effect I, I absolutely love. Adam knows that you know, tax strategy is, is my like favorite topic to talk about. And it's very applicable because I mean, rental real estate, when you really understand all the benefits of it, especially from a, like a real estate professional status, um, and you're really in the business, I mean, there's, oh man, it's, there's nothing else that compares. Let's talk about the kids a little bit. Um, you know, that's something that I think a lot of people have heard about and interested in. Um, it, and it's a great way to involve your family and teach them a little bit of the business too, in the real estate side, if they're interested in it. Adam, his, uh, some of his kids are professional actors. And so they actually do have an income, um, uh, Netflix, right? Adam, is that the <coughs> you know, Netflix series? It but, was HBO. Uh, HBO. Okay. But, uh, anyways, I mean, how, can you give us kind of a real world example and like, how do you actually structure that on having your kids be employees and in, in income shifting? Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, kind of real world example is it can be just as simple as having, you know, maybe somebody has two kids and they're, you know, in their 10, 11, 12 years old. You know, obviously the, the older they are, the more work they can do because their skill set is, you know, theoretically higher. Right. But, um, you know, real world example is, you know, say a family is in, you know, 30, 40 percent federal and state tax bracket. Right. But kids, maybe they maybe they have another job. Maybe they don't have another job. But. Um, generally speaking right now, kids can, you know, any, any individual can, you know, earn about $12,500 and not have to pay income taxes on it. So if you are a family that's paying, you know, 40% federal and state and you pay your kids say $10,000, I mean, you're going to save $4,000 for the parents. Right. But then the kid's not going to pay income taxes on it. So as a family, you've just saved $4,000, um, we all know that's money you're already giving the kids anyway, right? It's just we're trying to find a way for them to help in your business so you can take a tax deduction for it. And then obviously the other, all you know, the ancillary benefits is that they're learning, you know, hopefully good working habits, a sense of responsibility, that kind of thing, right, to help you in your business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the kids can, um, you know, if, if you can convince them to, they can take part of that earnings and maybe put it into a retirement account, right, for like a Roth IRA, for example. And that would be so powerful, you know, to, to, to have young kids with money in a retirement account that's potentially growing tax free. Instead of spending it on video games. Yeah, for the rest <laughs> of their lives, right? I love it. Teach them about investing. And so and it's really up to you to decide what, what their age is, skill set, what their interest is, and, and how you apply that to your, your real estate investing business. Yeah, I mean, the IRS does require it to be reasonable, right? So that's where, you know, depending on their age, and then each child is different, you know, um, and, and so so depending on their age and the compensation, I think the question you would ask yourself really is, if I wasn't paying my child and I was paying my neighbor's child to do these same tasks, what is the reasonable compensation that, you know, that this particular task would uh, warrant, right? And that's how you determine what the compensation should be. Now, when we talked about kind of business structure a few minutes ago, um, you mentioned you don't have to have an LLC and S Corp, anything like that. You can do it individually. It seems like in this situation, if you're going to do, you know, having employees, your kids working for you, it seems like an entity structure would be very, very beneficial in that situation when it comes to justifying it to the IRS. Can you talk a little bit about kind of what is what are good entity structures to set up whenever you are doing this? Is it just the simple LLC like people think about and put the property in or should they form an S corp for hiring their kids? Um, kind of how do you go about doing that? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. And, you know, legal entity is, is another one of those areas where there's not a one size fits all. So the answer will differ significantly from one investor to the next. Um, but speaking about income shifting, 
that strategy in itself, you actually don't have to have a legal entity. Um, and, and depending on the age of your kids, uh, sometimes it might be less beneficial when you're paying them from an entity like an S corporation. Um, and the reason for that is for kids who I think is age 18 and younger, if you're paying them from like a sole proprietorship, they avoid part of the um, uh uh, payroll taxes payroll taxes, yeah. that they would otherwise have to pay if you instead paid them through an S corporation and did a W-2 and things like that. So, um, so, so, so yeah, paying your kids itself doesn't necessarily mean you should have a legal entity. Um, for people who are landlords, right, rental real estate, people who have rental income, um, for the most part, what, you know, the, the only reason you would have it in an LLC would be for asset protection purposes. OK, so we're concerned with tenants or other people suing us. We put in a legal entity so that we get the asset protection. But in terms of the deductions, a lot of the ones that we've talked about so far, um, they are available regardless of whether it's in an LLC or not in an LLC. Because it all um, flows through, right? It all, all flows, flows through. through right. Now, if you're someone else who has more active real estate income, if you're a syndicator, if you're flipping, flipping yeah wholesaling, property management income, uh, those are a little bit different. Um, those are ones where it could potentially be beneficial to operate those inside of a different kind of entity, maybe like a corporation, S Corp or C Corporation. Um, S Corp specifically helps you to avoid or minimize your self-employment taxes. So, you know, as a general, as, as kind of a, a standard example, if you made $100,000 of fix and flip income, having an S Corporation could potentially save you $7,000 or more um, in self-employment taxes. Okay, but, but those are very different than rental real estate. We typically don't recommend holding rentals in any sort of a corporation. There's always it, anomalies, but generally speaking, we don't. And that could even that. be like a, for an active type of business. I mean, and that could even be short-term rentals potentially or some other stuff that you're doing, consulting. I mean, you can do the like an LLC S-Corp selection or something like this. Um, what, are, what are some other low-hanging fruit for just the average person that might just like, you know, you, you found in your experience working with people that are just like a, a few things that easily most people can take advantage of in the tax planning, but they, they're just not aware of it. Yeah. I mean, you talked a little bit about entity structuring, depending on your business. I mean, that that could be one of them, um, just owning rental real estate in general. But is there any other kind of key points like aha moments with working <laughs> with people with uh, tax strategy? Yeah, well, short term rentals, you touched on that one. Um, that's a huge area right now for tax planning. Um, a lot of investors are getting into short term rental and there are some huge benefits with respect to short term rental properties. Yeah, I mean, we were talking earlier about the whole um, <clears throat> real estate professional status, right? If you've got losses on your rental properties, you want to use those losses to offset non-rental income, you can do that with a real estate professional. Well, when, you know, a real estate professional actually applies to long-term rentals. So short-term rentals are kind of their own little bucket, if you will. And so with short-term rentals, if you can generate losses from them, and, you know, I guess taking a step back, when we say losses, we're not meaning you're losing money. We're talking about... <laughs> You know, hopefully the Working depreciation like the money. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the depreciation expense is kind of more than your income, right? So you're creating a loss on paper and we want to be able to use that loss to offset your other income. Well, with short term rentals, it's actually a little bit easier to do that. Uh, all you really need to do is um in the tax world they call it material participation, but kind of for the layman's terms, is uh, you know, if you're really in self managing your self short term rentals and kind of dealing with the day to day stuff it's a lot easier to meet the qualifications to be able to use that loss to offset your W-2 or interest, dividend income, business income, whatever it is. A lot easier than it would might be for a long-term rental and a real estate professional. Yeah, and you know, short-term rentals for the most part, right, we are um, doing the furnishings up front. Um, so a lot of that right now is eligible for bonus depreciation. Yeah. We have a lot of investor clients who have, you know, buy a pool table or even build a pool in, in the property for short term rentals, getting kayaks and all that kind of stuff um, are potentially eligible for bonus depreciation. So that's where, you know, kind of the big tax loss can be generated. And, um, you know, like Matt said, you don't have to be a real estate professional. So this works a lot with investors who maybe are working full time still, <coughs> or maybe both spouse, spouses are working full time and they're in real estate and they want to use those losses to try to wipe out or reduce some of that W-2 income. It's a, a, you know, pretty, you know, one of those low hanging fruits and pretty significant when it comes to tax savings. Right? Yeah. Excellent. Well, yeah. So, you know, you talked a little bit about kind of the, the low hanging fruit. Does the fruit become juicier as you build up your portfolio or is it kind of the same strategy 
when you have one as opposed to, you know, 10, 20, 30? Yeah, you know, that's such a great question, because I think um, when I hear this a lot from newer investors, you know, who say, hey, these are all great things you're talking about, but I'm not at that level yet. I'm not a big investor yet, so I'm not going to do tax planning. Um, because I don't have that many properties to work with, or my income is not that high to work with. And actually, um, what I tend to see is that for the people who have lower income, um, oftentimes the savings are a lot more impactful, right? So people who have lower income maybe don't have as much money to invest into their second, third, or fourth property. And in those scenarios, if you can save five or ten thousand um, dollars, that's very impactful because that gives you a lot more money to go after the next deal. So, um, so, so, so I think it's never too early to start being proactive in your tax planning. And in fact, um, tax savings is probably one of the easiest ways for you to supercharge your pathway to financial freedom, right? If if normally we just work, pay taxes, and whatever we have remain, we invest, but instead we take the tax issue out and whatever we're making, right, you know, uh, 10,000 in rental income, all of that goes into a down payment for my next property. Instead of taking 10 years to financial freedom, it might only take you five years or four years, right? That's um, a huge point. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the level of savings, of course, you know, the, the higher the dollar amount, the more portfolio, you know, the larger the portfolio, the higher the potential tax savings. Right? But, but it, you know, you're adding zeros to it, right? But the strategy is the same. That's the thing that I think a lot of people have this misconception that, well, you know, somebody with a $5 million portfolio is using vastly different strategies than somebody with a $500,000 rental portfolio. And that, and that, you know, some of those things might be different, but from a big picture, a lot of that tax strategy is going to be just the same. It's just adding zeros to it, right? Yeah, you probably just add a couple more tools when you're, you know, in the millions of dollars of, of income or revenue. Um, but a lot of the standard stuff that we're talking about today, the kind of the foundational strategies, you know, even very high income or low income individuals are, are utilizing the same. Thing. I mean, what can you be specific on a couple of those tools for so, some people that are? Well, I think I think like one one thing that people big misconception is um, cost segregation studies. So a lot of people think that you need to have millions and millions of dollars of real estate to be able to benefit from a cost segregation study. Don't and get that's, that started. Yeah, I mean, that's very far from the truth, right? I mean, it's so, you know, for those people who don't know, a cost segregation study is where you hire a, you know, kind of a firm, an engineering firm to go in, they look at a property, they're trying to break out components of the property to depreciated uh, quicker, right? So rental property, residential house, you depreciate over 27 and a half years. When they do a cost that we're looking at ways, can we depreciate it uh, quicker, like five years, seven years, 15 years? And with bonus depreciation now, some of that stuff might be written off all in the first year. And so getting the same amount of depreciation, but um, just taking it quicker. And so there's a lot of misconceptions that, well, that only works with, you know, your commercial properties or what have you. But no, it works with single family houses where people buy a house for two hundred thousand dollars. You know, we've seen it day in and day out at, at our firm and from a tax planning perspective. Yeah, um, I think just to put like some numbers to it, right? Let's say you you know you put a twenty thousand dollar down payment on a build, you know, and you bought buy a property for one hundred thirty thousand, right? Let's just assume that the building portion is a hundred thousand dollars with cost segregation and, and, and bonus depreciation, which we have in 2022 at 100%, your first year write-off might, <coughs> might be as high as 30,000, right? So think about that. You put $20,000 down payment resulting in an immediate deduction of $30,000. It's more than the down payment you put in. Um, and that's where, because of the current law um, and you know, kind of adding one strategy on top of another, that's where, like Matt was saying, a lot of misconceptions and people are thinking, wow, that sounds a great, like a great strategy, but I can't afford it because it's only for the large apartment owners where it's not necessarily the case. And we've seen it work time and time again with smaller investors who just have one or two rental properties. No, that's outstanding. And I, I think you touched on this point earlier about being under that $100, $150,000 and below. I mean, you could potentially even take accelerated depreciation on without being a real estate professional, right? In that in that setting. Um, yep, definitely. If your income is under uh, under so one hundred thousand and under, you can take up to twenty five thousand dollars of rental losses against your other type of income. And then, if your income is between one hundred and one fifty, there's just a phase out. Um, now, is that single or combined? It's both. 
Okay. Yeah, it's 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 the same for whether you're single or married, but believe it or not. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I mean, we have a lot of investors that are in that range that, um, you know, whether it's a uh, dual income family or single income family that just probably isn't aware of that, but that's a huge thing. I mean, and this is so vitally important. That's why we um, have such excellent guests like yourselves on our shows, because this is so important to people. This is the best way to give yourself an immediate raise, right? Is just pay less taxes and expedite your investing ventures and have more capital working for you now is to have some of these tax strategies implemented. This is the, the ultimate hack really um, versus, I mean, if you had to go out and earn an, an additional 50% on your money, um, you know, I mean, earning an additional 50% of income, that's a lot of time involved unless you're starting a business or doing something like that. But the tax, the tax strategy is something that everyone needs to understand, especially getting into the rental real estate world. There's, there's so many benefits readily available. You just got to have the right people gu guiding you and educating yourself on that. Um, switching gears a little bit, um, talking about one, one thing we always love is the, you know, what, what real estate offers right now for people in terms of providing financial independence, uh, additional streams of income, tax benefits, et cetera. But ultimately the long-term goal is generational wealth. And we've seen that so many families have built generational wealth through real estate. Can we talk a little bit of just kind of what that picture looks like as far as we don't have to get great into the details here, but how, how can someone build up a really large portfolio and also have minimal tax on that, passing it to their their family and things like that. Yeah. Well, you know, we we've we've been talking a lot about deductions, right, and write-offs in terms of how we can get cash flow and not have to pay taxes currently. Um, the other benefit of owning real estate, in addition to cash flow, is the appreciation, right? And we've seen a lot of that in the last couple of years, uh, which is which is really great. Um, with depreciation, I mean, with appreciation. It's another way for investors to build wealth without paying taxes. Why? Because if my property that I purchased for $100,000 is now worth $400,000, I don't have to pay taxes on that appreciation, right? I don't have to pay taxes on any of that um, unless if I sell. And if I did sell for real estate specifically, I could still defer the taxes if I do a 1031 exchange. And for any of you who don't know, 1031 exchange is basically a tax law that allows us to sell one property, defer the paying taxes on the gain by reinvesting the money into another uh, rental property. OK, and that could be done like selling single family homes to reinvest in other single family homes or selling single family and re reinvesting in apartments. Yeah, or, buying, buying up, you know, buying to the next asset class per se. Right? Yeah, commercial center. So there's a lot of different ways to, um, you know, to utilize that. Uh, but be, so so another way to kind of grow that that uh, generational wealth, right, to create it without paying taxes currently. Um, another way we've seen people do it is just to tap into the equity, right? Similar example, $100,000 property, it's now worth $400,000. Um, what if I don't want to sell, but I do want to take that equity and use that to grow my portfolio and down payment on other real estate? So when you do a cash out refi on a property like that, um, that's also not taxable, right? You don't have to pay taxes on that money currently. If I pulled out $100,000 or $200,000 of cash, that's tax-free money to me today. Um, and what's more, if I took that money as a down payment on yet additional real estate, right, because I'm trying to grow my portfolio, I can also deduct the interest on that additional, um, that, that I'm paying on the additional loan proceeds that I've taken out. So there's a lot of different ways that you can utilize real estate, tap into all that equity and growth uh, with essentially no tax hit right, immediately. So um, really, you know, just a really wonderful vehicle. We get asked all the time about, you know, should I take the HELOC? Should I take out some equity on this property uh, that could affect the cash flow a little bit? Obviously, you want to make sure the property is going to support it. You know, the cash, the cash flow supporting the new debt on that property. But if you really look at it to take out $100,000 of equity on a property through a cash out refi, if you were to get that $100,000 through another income source or taking out it from other investments, selling stock, something like that, that is all taxable events. Sure. And so I think that that point is overlooked a lot of, okay, here's a hundred, like legit net hundred thousand dollars to invest that is tax free and equity is yes, that's money sitting in, in equity, but you have such thing as a return on equity. You need to be utilizing that equity to actually get a higher return on that. And then you get additional tax benefits by doing that. So that's yeah. a huge point people should look at. 
Yeah, I mean, or alternatively, let's say you didn't tap into it and you were just hoping to save money, right, from working, from your paychecks to do it. <laughs> so you probably have to make like, what, $150,000 and then after paying federal income taxes, state income taxes, payroll taxes, and then maybe you'll net to like, you know, something like $100,000, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, really great way to tap into funds without paying taxes. When it comes to the tax strategy, tax planning, one of the things that um, people might get concerned about is, if you're making a strategy and implementing more tools into your um, tax prep and all of that, have you seen, does it open you up to the bigger likelihood of an audit or anything like that? Or does it not really matter? It's not going to impact you at all. You're still doing, you know, obviously you're doing all of these things legally, but are they, is the IRS going to look at it and say, these people are doing different things than these people. We need to look at them more closely or does it not really impact it? Yeah, I'd say it depends on what it is, right? I mean, it's, uh, and it depends on the person too. It's, uh, you know, I guess various scenarios, like real estate professional status is something that the IRS quote unquote says they are going to audit more. Uh, you know, in practice, we haven't necessarily seen it. I mean, you know, every once in a while, yes, somebody gets selected for audit and they want to look at real estate professional, but they could get selected for audit for something totally unrelated to that, right? And, you know, and, and they're not always going to tell you exactly why they've selected somebody for audit. Unfortunately, that's not always um kind of you know information they give out but um mm -hmm. but yeah there, i mean there's certain things obviously there's there's things on tax returns where you know if somebody's got a rental property and they're wanting to take a bunch of deductions on it but they don't have any rental income showing on the return you know uh, you know that could be a red flag right that hey you know did you really is this really a rental property you know did you advertise it for rent you know things like that those are one-off things but um but yeah, I think it all comes down to, you know, if again, if you are legally entitled to take a tax deduction or a tax position on your return, um, you know, our point is don't be afraid to do it. Just have your ducks in a row that if, you know, if you did get audited, you know, two, three years down the road, you have the documentation in place to support real estate professional or to support those deductions or what have you. Yeah, and I would have to say, you know, for us, so in our firm, because um, although we mostly focus on the proactive planning side for investors, um, we do have a you know good number of tax return clients too that's been with us for for many many years, um, and you know a, a, a very large percentage of our clients do use the strategies that we're talking about, right? Whether it's real estate professional or sh uh, short-term rental loophole or cost segregation. Um, so, so uh, you know, uh, being that a large percentage of our clients do utilize those, we have very few audits that come through our firm in terms of tax returns that we prepare. Um, you know, I, I don't know, on average, maybe like one audit every two years or something like that. So it's still um, fairly low, I would say. I think it's really important, Matt, you brought up a good point about um, not being afraid. I, I think so many people have a fear standpoint with the IRS and no one should be afraid of an audit. If an audit happens, you know, that that's OK. I mean, that's important to these are not when we talk about <coughs> tax benefits of real estate. These are not things illegal or sneaky that you're doing. These are not I really don't even like the term loopholes. Because of the reason, there's a reason behind why the IRS code is written this way. And often it's to encourage people to go out and do proactive things like this to and you know, increase the economy, to revitalize a certain area, to invest more money in this sector, things like this. So it causes economic growth. And that's the underlying reason why the IRS is writing the code it is. So really in their eyes, you're you're being, you know, a proactive member of society following the rules and this is just something you need to understand and it's important that you do that if you get audited it's not the end of the world that's why you have professionals going through this with you it's important to make sure that you are working with the right professionals so you take advantage of these things and they can make you a better more savvy and successful investor um, but don't look at it from a fear standpoint because really what where fear comes from is not understanding not understanding the code and understanding what you're doing um, just going back to the generational wealth aspect i mean is there any key points of um, recommendations you'd have for people in terms of how to set themselves up for success if you know maybe and this is probably far in the future for many people as they're just starting out on their journey but what I mean is as far as how to position someone let's say they're building this large portfolio they want to pass it on to their kids with minimal tax implications any key points about how to do that as far as like you know estate planning and things like that 
Yeah. Well, I mean, estate planning is also going to be very unique to each investor, right? It's going to depend. I mean, someone with, um, you know, $30 million of net worth is going to have a very different estate planning strategy than someone with, you know, $2 million worth of, of net worth, right? But generally speaking, for, for investors who are starting out, who are not at that, you know, high level in terms of net worth, um, the, the, the key thing to, to keep in mind is, is we don't want to prematurely start passing assets to our kids. And the reason for that is right now we have what's called a step up basis, okay, which means that when someone passes away, their real estate gets stepped up to fair market value. So as an example, I bought a property for $100,000. Over the years, I've taken all the depreciations on it. I got all the benefits in my lifetime. Now my basis in the property is zero. If I were to give it to my kids while I'm alive, they're going to inherit my basis, which is you know, zero. And so when they sell it, they're going to have to pay capital gains on all that appreciation. But on the other hand, if I held on to that property, and let's say when I pass away, the fair market value is 500,000. So now when my kids inherit the property, they get it at $500,000. That's now their basis. So when they sell the first $500,000, they don't have to pay capital gains taxes on. So something very important to keep in mind, because we do see this happen a lot where as people get older, they start to um, add their kids uh, on title to their properties, right? So you have that fear like, okay, I need to save it for my kids. So prematurely adding title, prematurely gifting it to the next generation. Um, and, you know, not to say that that's the wrong thing to do, but oftentimes that could have negative consequences. So it's important to make sure that you're planning with your CPA on um, whether or not that's something that could make sense in, in, you know, in your situation. And I think also from a, you know, just a nuts and bolts of basics you know the very least they're going to want to you know meet with an estate planning attorney right and get a get a will taken care of get a living trust you know drawn up and you know do they have beneficiaries get that all taken care of and incorporated you know do they have entities from an asset protection standpoint get that incorporated as well so those would be the basic things to definitely look into to kind of get that get it set up in the right path yeah That's huge. Plus don't use up your kids loan slots come on don't put them on title <laughs> <laughs> If you want to help them grow their portfolio, leave it open. Yeah. And also, too, you know, part of um, we see, too, is we, once you start gifting ownership to a property, uh, you know, either whether partial or full, um, you're also gifting some, away some of the tax benefits, right? So if you are the high income uh, person, whether, it's, you know, high income from working or from, from retirement, you want to keep all that depreciation. But now if your kids start owning 50%, now half of that depreciation becomes theirs, right? So something very important to make sure um, that that we keep in mind. But but yes, I think, um, you know, you're absolutely right, is that a lot of these things, these tax benefits, uh, or what people might call loopholes, are really ways the government is incentivizing us to, to take action on certain things. And I think for Matt and I, we see it all the time. You know, with bonus depreciation, a lot of investors are in a hurry to buy more real estate, to rehab their properties, to reappliance everything in their apartments. Why? Because we can write off more today immediately rather than waiting until next year to do it. Um, so, so at least that's, you know, the, the, the incentive to do that. Um, it, definitely we see that work in, in terms of, you know, real life investor decisions being made accordingly. Yeah, I've definitely pushed some of my closings pretty hard to make sure they get done in December. That's uh, <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> well, Matt and Amanda, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, once again, Matt and Amanda are co-founders of Keystone CPA. The website is keystonecpa.com. That's keystonecpa.com. Is there anything else you want to leave our listeners with today? Um, I think that, you know, if you're someone who's looking for even more tax strategies, um, definitely check out our ebook. Uh, that's the one that you, know, you can find on our website at keystonecpa.com. We talk more about legal entity structuring and income shifting and um, just commonly missed tax benefits for real estate investors who are starting out. So you can check that out at our website. Can I throw in one last one? If just kind of in your guys' opinion, if, if there's, since you're working with so many real estate investors, is there any kind of last parting advice you have for people that you've been, you've seen, and this could be from the tax side or just in general with real estate investors, p things that are separating out people that are being really successful in the space versus those who are not making the traction they need to, or just not getting started. I mean, I think the thing that I always, I always go back to is, you know, make sure you got a good team, right? It's, you know, I think the one, the people that I see that are successful are the people that have 
embrace the idea of getting people around them to help them do things. And they're not going to figure it all out on their own and they're, they're okay to ask for help. Uh, and, and that can be just, you know, that could be working with a tax advisor, a legal advisor, but that's also just from building a real estate portfolio or having the right team of people looking for properties for you and, you know, getting the financing that you need or, you know, not, not trying to do it all yourself, obviously, I think is the biggest piece of advice. Yeah. And I think um, having a plan uh, and, you know, having a plan and really executing on that plan, whether it's my plan, you know, this year, my plan is to buy three rental properties or my plan is to, you know, get into a, an apartment building or something like that. And of course, as part of your plan, make sure you have the tax components to it. Um, we talked earlier about audit, the fear of audit. You're afraid of an audit when you you are not pre-planning. Right. When it's like, I've already did this now, how can I unwind it? What are some of the things that I can do in a sneaky way to correct what happened? When you're doing proactive planning, everything is done above board. In fact, uh, with one issue, am I going to sell property? You might have three or four different strategies for you to pick and choose from. Right. And then you're not losing sleepless nights because, you know, you've done everything correctly. Right. Wise words. Thank you. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. Really appreciate it. To all our listeners, once again, their website is keystonecpa.com. And you can find us at renttoretirement.com. Zach was just asking about getting started. Well, you can find all the properties that we have to offer there at Rent to Retirement in the active inventory. Really appreciate you listening to this episode. Please leave us a review on whatever podcast platform you use. It greatly helps us. And don't forget to, if you have any questions, email them to podcasts at renttoretirement.com. That's podcasts at renttoretirement.com. And I'll talk to you on the next episode. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks for watching the Rent to Retirement YouTube channel. Check out some of our other videos, like this one or this one here.